Hi everyone, a very, very warm welcome to the Drums webinar today, all around winning awards, not just entering them, but hopefully placing well and winning, whether it be an award or a highly commend. For anyone that doesn't know me, my name is Lynn Lester, I'm Managing Director of Events here at Drum, and I have been in probably, I would say about over 250 judging rooms. I've got to spend a lot of time with very good people over quite a few years. And luckily today we're joined by an amazing panel. So thank you guys for joining us. Welcome. welcome. Thanks for having us. So I'm going to ask each of you now just to intro yourselves and you can tell the world who you are, but actually when you intro yourself, you can also tell us what award of the drum that you have judged before so we can put everything in context in terms of how we discuss things moving forward. So Lisa, we'll start with you. So I'm Lisa Hale. I'm um head of social media at Specsavers. I've been in that role for um, just over 18 months now, um, but initially my career um, was agency side, um, so seeing both sides of the of the spectrum. Um, and, and actually traditionally more in PR, uh, that was my background, and as the landscape, you know, PR landscape evolved, so did, um, so did what I do, and we looked at PR a lot more holistically. Um, and then in terms of awards, so I've written and entered lots and lots of awards and um, probably most recently um won an, a few drums for uh, pizza hut vinto and last week we won uh, our first spec savers award for our um, sponsorship of the ashes and um, so and then last year um sort of took part in the uh, pr awards uh, the inaugural pr awards for the drum and um, so judged judged those you certainly did and you were a very good judge at that so thank you then <laughs> it's probably over to you yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Toby Horry, and I'm the brand and content director at TUI. Um, before I've been at TUI about mm, just under two years, and before that I was at Tesco for three years, and then before that I was also agency side. So again, I, I've also seen sort of both um, both sides of this. Um, and I um, recently judged the the content uh, awards for drums, so that's um, that's why I'm here today. Thank you, and Ruben. Hello, uh, I'm Ruben Turner. I'm uh, Exec Creative Director at Good Agency. Um, I've uh, been quite closely involved with the Drum Social Purpose Award um, for two or three years. And last year I was um, chair of the judges. So I helped put the panel together and kind of uh, helped to kind of guide the, the judging on the day. Yeah, the stress of being a chair, but we can talk a bit more about that in a minute. So what I think would be quite good just to sort of kick us off, obviously everyone tuning in, are, you know, they're here to sort of get hints and tips about how to enter. And by the way, everyone, we've got a chat function, so make sure if you've got any questions, do ask. So I think what would be really good is for people to understand what it's like to be a judge, because for a lot of people viewing, they've probably never done that job before. So does anybody want to kick off about, you know, how, how does it work? How do you consume the information and just any kind of like, kind of top line overview on that? So anyone, I'll, I'll open it out. Um, I would I would say, you know, number one, like you're writing one entry or putting in one entry um, and the judges are maybe um, sifting through 100, you know, or more. So it's really important to think about it from that point of view, you know, that just the sheer volume of everything that you have to do and the time in which you have to do it with means that, you know, as an entrant, I think you need to get people's attention because um, as a judge, you know, you're just facing so much great work and so much um, information and insight and so many different uh, award films and all of that. Yeah, anyone else want to add? In terms of sort of coming together and, and what judging, what it, I mean, I'm just going to touch on the experience of being a judge, I think, um, to begin with, but it, it's really good to get together um, with your peers and, and also see all that different uh, different work from across different industries and different agencies. And um, that, that's been really interesting um, to sort of be able to compare that and, and have um, the luxury of being able to do that. It's been really good. But I think in that as well, um, as you say, there's we get so many ent um, entries. And I think that exact summary uh, that we talked about is really important in terms of making sure that we're summing up everything up front because we have a lot to read through and um, what you don't want is loads of waffle, really. Yeah, but someone's actually asking the question of, honestly, how long do you take to read the entries? Like how much attention do you give each one? Well, because it's split into, so you're split into different teams when you're judging. 
Um, so everyone everyone gets sort of a, a sort of two. Well, in my experience, I don't know if it, if it's changed on on the, in the other entries, but you sort of in you sort of judging about two to three categories each. Um, so within those categories, yeah, there there are sort of lots and lots of awards. So in terms of reading every single one line by line, in all honesty, you kind of know if it's a goer from from the exec summary, and that that's why the exec summary is so important. Yeah, Toby, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think we we'll probably spend about ten minutes. Um, 10 minutes probably on average on each one, but I would definitely agree that I think for me the two most important things are um, make it an enjoyable read. I mean, if you've got a lot of these things to read, let's, let's tr try and make it, you know, something that is nice to read. And I think then the, the critical information, having that really concisely set out, I think in the exact summary, but also just throughout the paper, if there's really critical points you need to communicate, you know, I, I maybe it's a personal style, but I think using bullet points, you know, really pulling stuff out as being this is this is a really critical point don't be afraid to, to sort of pull stuff out rather than just having you know great long tracts of text um, and from which the judge has to then you know sift through and find what's the important thing in this paragraph that I'm really looking for so so I think let, how you lay it out is actually quite important yeah, yeah. I think we kind of touched on kind of you know exact summary so so if you're being honest as you say, the first thing you kind of look at is you, you get all these entries and they've got a format and that's why people shouldn't deter from the format because you're kind of used to reading things systematically. So you kind of get, you've got the exec summary there. What should people put in that then? If that's the first thing you look at, what stuff should go in that exec summary? I mean, I think you, you, what I meant by, you know, whether it's a go or not, I don't want to sound like a complete dismiss it if you, if you, if you have nailed the exec summary. But I, I think the point to make is, um, you know up front and you need to put up front uh, how you've helped the business objective essentially and make that really clear um, and if, if it's not clear or the objectives aren't and how you've met them aren't aren't clear in that then you know that you, there's a lot of work for us to do as judges on the judging side then to piece that together and try and join those dots and that's when you start to lose um, I guess the attention of judges at that point. Yeah, you almost I think have to think about what's going to stick in somebody's memory from that from that exec summary. So is there a way that you can kind of brand or um, give an identity to your entry? So it's like the campaign that or the first campaign to or you know what I mean? It's like what's the yeah. thing that's going to stick in somebody's mind? Um, and and so often entries don't really do that. They just talk about why it was a good piece of work, but they don't kind of talk about why they're different. Yeah, no, that's quite nice. I suppose it's a standout, isn't it? It's a standout commentary that you kind of go, oh, okay, I want to read a bit more about this. And then once you do that, I'm just trying to, for people to give them a feel of, of how you navigate an entry. So obviously you've got the exact summary. I mean, for each, I mean, it's like, you know, there could be multiple answers here, I get that. But you obviously you would read the exact summary. Would you be then inclined to go, if there was a case study video, would you go straight to that, do you think? Or do, would you continue to read a bit more, then start looking at support and information after that? I, mean, I think I've oh, gone. Sorry, I, was gonna, I, I think I tend to read Ruben? the paper first, and then um, and then use the then look at the video. Um, and I think the the thing about videos is that they they can be massively helpful, but I think you still need to apply the same thinking, as in you need to set out what were the objectives, what was the insight, what's the work, and what's the results. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think if if you can, you know, that that I think is kind of a, a structure for an exact summary and for a paper overall. But also, I think deploy that same thinking through a, through an awards video because I think the danger is with an awards video, you just make it sort of look nice. But actually, you, you know, if you can also impart that same rigorous information in a minute or a minute and a half, then that's massively helpful for a judge. Uh, and, and when someone goes in the, in the judging room, why did you point to that one? It's like, well, it's clear they set these objectives, they had this insight, brilliant work, and great results. So it just makes your makes your job a lot easier. A life easier. Yeah, because I think somebody was saying last time, because we, we did one of these before, and I think what we were kind of saying was, you know, whilst the video is really good, as long as it's a good video and it's it's not just pretty, it actually tells a story, they're not always necessary. I mean, I would always encourage people to include a video if they could, but some people don't have big budgets. So, I mean, you know, what reassurance would you give to people that actually if you don't have a video, you're not going to be marked down for that? I think um, judging, it, and this is really, this came out in our chat before, and it's really important to think about that panel of made up of different people with different um, different priorities and different ways of looking at uh, the world. So, you know, there's a point of view, which is there are people who are more um, analytical who will, who will study the results and you need to have those. And there yeah. are other people who are a bit more, um, a bit more like me, maybe a bit more superficial, you know, and they want to see 
work. They want to see some pictures. So it's like whether it doesn't have to be a video, you know, and it doesn't have to be like a big budget. But you need to, you know, if judging is at least in part emotional. So, you know, you do need to see something that, that makes you remember it, makes you feel excited about it. So I think you- the ones sometimes that drop off are the people who, you know, they, they, they put a lot of detail in the entry perhaps, but they, they might they might put one picture in, you know, or, or something. There's not anything for you to really kind of understand or grasp hold of. Yeah. Lisa, you were going to say something? <laughs> you can um, you can create a lot of drama as well, um, just in the writing. I know, like, obviously, like you said, you need imagery, and I agree with that. And I think even if, it, you know, what you've done is achieve press coverage or whatever, even if it's not your own content, send, put links to where you've seen it or comments that the people have said. I guess this, this is where um, PR does come into a writing award entries. Is it's a sell. You're trying to sell to someone, so you need to think about um, all different ways you can do that. And I think drama in whatever form is is what's needed. Sensationalise yeah. it, basically. <laughs> I think the other thing that's important is to remember that the, the work that you're that you might have done might be for a very specific audience, um, and therefore sort of don't assume that the judges know that. I mean, there's a there's a paper I. I've pulled out, which we'll probably talk about in a little bit, which was aimed at people who are bu- buying um, port automation software in large um, large docks and ports across the world. So that's clearly a very, very specific audience. Um, and therefore, just spending a little bit of time just making sure the judges understand this work was not, you know, to, to, to try and get millions of people to buy a chocolate bar. This is to get probably about 100 people in the world to buy a piece of software. So just making sure you help the judges understand who this work was for is massively important. Yeah, and I think as well, when I've been in judging rooms, you, I do hear the jury sometimes saying, well, actually, given who that client is and given the budget they had, wow, we did an amazing job. So, you know, I think some people think it's all about the shiny budget. And I mean, but what would you say, you know, and again, I think it's pretty straightforward, but it's, it's nice for other people to hear it from you. Like, if you've got a small budget, budget versus a big budget, like, does that make a big difference in how you view an entry? No, oh, I really? think it, Sorry, go on. No, I, I, just, I think it comes down to being to um to, to being clever, and and that's got nothing to do with the budget. Um, budgets help. If, gosh, if you if you combine big budgets with really clever thinking, that's like the holy grail. But equally, you know, if you're clever and and you've you've helped the business achieve something, that's what we're all here to do. And you show that really clearly and and succinctly. That that's all it needs to be. Yeah, Ribbon, what about you? No, Sorry. I, I, I would absolutely no, I'd absolutely agree, and I think I, I think there's quite a, often a lot of um, sympathy in juries and in jury rooms for people who are you know doing something um, really good with a small budget, you know, and they're quite yeah. often people look for those entries extra hard. So one of the things that won at um, the uh, Social Purpose Awards last year was entry, entered by a small. Um, like Derbyshire Health Authority, and it was like a sexual health campaign. You know, it didn't have a really posh award film. Um, obviously, like quite low budget, but people just loved it, and they loved the kind of energy and the cheekiness of it. Yeah. And, and you know, that won up against um, really big, really big budget. Uh, you know, organisations and agencies. Yeah, and Toby, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, um, uh, and I guess this is sort of less just about wars but sort of more marketing life in general is is always try and put a, a very small amount of the budget towards actually measuring your success and, I, and i'd say that often beyond just reach or impressions i mean these days reach is you know if you're thinking about social media it's reasonably easy to um to gauge but that doesn't necessarily marry up to the marketing objectives you're set out so and I, but, I, but i think the positive side there are you know often quite low cost ways of actually sort of judging stuff whether it be a simple omnibus question um to 100 people to you know exposed and non-exposed so i'd always just try and think about uh, am i going to measure whether this was successful or not um and and, and that you know if you then end, do end up writing an award paper it's going to be massively helpful yeah, no, definitely. And I think something that sort of like kind of round up kind of what you were saying was, you know, at, at the end of the day, you're, you're human. Um, and I think a lot of it's how people capture your emotions. So it's how you, you know, you look at things. I mean, obviously, if you get videos, you you know, you attack other senses. So I, I think it's just remembering that people are sort of probably over the weekend, you've maybe got, I don't know, a glass of wine or your mocktail or whatever your preference is, and you're reading lots of these things. So anything, you know, and I think people shouldn't be frightened of of you know being humorous or being a bit playful obviously in context of the entry because I suppose it gives you something to kind of go oh okay I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued here um, it's definitely one of the things as a judge to be mindful of is 
sometimes you sit there and you go, oh, I've seen this. Uh-huh. And, and therefore it puts, it, you put it in a different bit of your brain. But I think that's why, you know, that, that sort of understanding of the target audience is massively important because clearly I've never seen the thing about the portal automation software, but that doesn't mean it's not a really good entry. So I think as judges, sometimes you need to sort of check yourself and just go, just because I haven't seen this in the real world doesn't mean it couldn't be a brilliant piece yeah. of work. Yeah. And in fact, with that one, it's it's all the better because you haven't seen it because clearly it's, it's to the right people. And yeah. I would say that, you know, last weekend I spent, um, I, I, last weekend I watched probably a hundred award films, not for fun, I was judging it. <laughs> and I would, say that, I would say that 90% of them are re- follow the same formula. They've got the same music, the same structure. They use all the same language. They use all the same graphics. So just anything that you can think of, um, you know, as Lisa says, to add a sense of drama and just stand out, it's just, it's well worth doing and making it, you know, live in the world of the entry and making it about your audience kind of thing and bringing that world to life is, um, is a fantastic thing. Really to do. important. Well, really kind of following on from that then, so Toby, I'm going to come to you. So you, you kind of gave an insight a second ago about an entry that we're going to discuss, because I think the reason we're doing this is discussing certain entries is sometimes people will often say to us, why didn't I win? You're like, well, I actually don't know why you didn't win. I can tell you why something did win. Um, yeah. the judges will focus on that. So it's really, and it's, it's quite heartbreaking because you can't give the feedback you really want to give to people. But we're going to talk about an entry that actually didn't win an award, but it got a highly commended. Now, before we go into that, um, I'm always preaching. I mean, people just think I say it for the sake of saying it. Like, you know, to be highly commended is a really big deal. But actually, is it a big deal? Um, Toby, I'll ask you because I'm going to come to you for, for this um, entry. But how do you position in your head? You've got the award, you've got highly commended. How do they differ? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, I mean, the, the reality of awards is that, you know, cl- clearly it slightly depends on the category and who you're up against in, in any particular year. Um, and I, for me, I mean, a highly commended um, is often, you know, something that in any, you know, in, in a different year might have won. It just so happens that in this year there was something else that, that bettered it. So I think for me, a highly commended is one that can meet the, the standard where it, it could have won. It just so happened that on that particular day there was something else that just nudged ahead of it. Yeah. Um, but but I think therefore, you know, I, th- I think the highly commended up, you know, so I know sometimes it's a bit like, oh, you know, it didn't win. But but it, I think it's um, it should be a marker of something that actually could easily have won on a, on a different day. Yeah, definitely. And the one that we're going to talk about now, so it's basically a safe, it's called Safe Tug 360. And it was then by Stein IS. So, do you, a, do you want to explain what it is, and then B, yeah. tell me why you liked it? I'll do my very best. Um, so, so this is a company called Trelleborg Marine, who I think are based in Denmark, and um, and they make port automation software. So, for these big ports in uh, across the world, uh, having software which actually basically enables you to get ships into port and containers off ships as quickly as possible and actually track where these things are going so it's quite specific you know and I'm, I'm clearly not an expert in this field um but what what i think was really great about that paper is that is that i mean firstly they, they did have very little money um so and, and i don't uh, there was a there was a very short awards video but what they did really well is that they, they they made it really clear what the objective was who they were trying to talk to and as i say this was actually quite a small number of people in the world who actually have the procurement power to buy this software so they'd really honed down on who it was they were trying to target um, they made it really clear that the number of those people that they they had um, they had got to with this, this piece of work and then actually tracked the um, the sales they got off the back of it I mean there were some assumptions made in the in the um, in the sort of ROI calculations but but I think given it was such a small budget, you kind of go, well, that's, that's fine because they're not going to have a sophisticated econometric model to have worked this out. But they have demonstrated, here's the objectives, here's the work, here's the insight, here's the audience, and, and this is the results we saw off the back of it. So as I say, even though it was a very, quite a niche B2B um, entry with quite a small budget, for me, it just actually ticked all the boxes in what, what you're looking for in a paper um, because it um, it it, um, it demonstrated all those things, so I think for that reason, I think it's um, actually just a really good example and one of those ones that should give hope to people who don't have massive budgets that they can do well in a war like this. Yeah, and do you think seeing the range, so bear in mind you didn't really understand the subject matter as such, did they explain it in such a way that they really sort of dumbed it down, simplified it, so you're like, all oh, right, totally get it. Oh yeah, they had to dumb it down a lot, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but no, they they. They provided enough information so it was like yeah i get it I, you know i clearly didn't need to know chapter and verse in terms of you know how this software worked 
um, but they um, they demonstrated uh, or they just you put it in a as layman's terms as possible so I could go okay right, I understand this I can sort of see why you would need this software uh, yeah. if you were running a port so um, so yeah I think they did a really good job yeah I have to say Toby was a very smart judge so I'm not saying that he needed everything dumbed down but maybe just in that particular <laughs> <laughs> quite a lot of dumbing down let's be clear <laughs> that's really cool um I mean going back to the sort of storytelling then so obviously storytelling is kind of what helped that entry effectively yeah. Otherwise, it could have been quite boring, I would imagine. Not that I'm saying that's boring, but if you don't know it, then it might be a bit like, God. Um, so in terms of storytelling throughout the entries, and this might sort of lead nicely into the kind of other stuff we want to discuss, um, you know, how how do you tell a story? Like, I know it sounds sort of obvious, but like people are like, well, yeah, that's great storytelling, but I've got quite a, you know, even going back to the entry, I've got quite a boring client. And then... Um, I'm not really sure how to start telling this story. Like, what kind of off the cuff advice would you give? Um, I mean, one, one thing I was always told, and, and this is, I'm not saying this is should be for every paper, is actually just make it sound what you're trying to do is, is really, really hard. Um, so okay. you sort of set out, oh my God, this is like really impossible. How on earth are we yeah. going to do this? And oh my God, we did it. Uh, so I'm not saying that's the only way of doing it, but that's certainly one, one approach that you can take. But yeah. I think that's a really good point, though, because it is you do have to say, like, what was the problem? So that's how you look at you look at it in parts. Like, what was the what was the problem? Like, but basically, that sounds more challenging than saying what was the brief? So that what was the problem for the brand? And how did we how did how, you know, how did we address that? And it's that it's the drama along that that, that helps create that storytelling. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and Ruben, what about you? Yeah, I would I would agree. Like having that um, having that challenge in there, maybe taking people on the journey with you, you know, about like how you how you how you got to the idea and like how amazed you were by the results. So it's like help people live the journey of delivering that piece of work because it it is often times quite a kind of emotional and exciting thing. I remember going to um, see a presentation about the uh, Viva La Volvo work last year with the client. Oh, I love that. And the client was talking about the moment when she was like, "I'm going to get fired." You know, I'm going to lose my job for presenting this work, and you're like, oh you're in the room. Do you know what I mean? You're excited about like what happened, and you really bought into like the bravery of them actually like putting that out there. Yeah, that's, no, that's I, brilliant. I suppose bravery is a big thing, but we are going to move on to an entry, Lisa, that you really liked from the PR awards. So we're going to get everyone to mute because I think like you're going to get really horrible background noise, and we're going to play the Greg's piece of work. So um, there you go, a very different piece of work there. But Lisa, you're going to talk us through now, I hope, what you really liked about it and what kind of stood out and why, because this obviously done really well at the PR Awards. Yeah, so just I think just the first point was obviously that looks like a really sort of high production video, but um, I think overall that from looking at it, the budget wasn't huge um, to do this. So that's probably the first point to note. But I think probably everybody on this webinar has heard about the the vegan sausage roll and um, the way they executed this was brilliant so it's a bit of an anomaly one because it's like it's back to that sort of um you know you've got an amazing um product and, and, and a brand that everyone knows so you're in a good place already and, and in, all, in all honesty that's probably where it has to work a lot harder in terms of your award entry because you, you you're already in a really good place so um what was the challenge why was it hard for you and i think that that bit you really need to pull out and that that's what um the guys did really well here so just to give it a bit of context, um, it all started with Petter um, doing a petition for, um, for Greg's to create a vegan sausage roll that 20,000 people um, signed up to, and then Greg's responded. So it was really it was really good that they were being sort of culturally relevant with that. Um, but their business objective was really clear in the outset, and it was to shift perceptions um, of Greg's as a modern food on the go brand. Um, but essentially, what they needed to do was sell products. So that was the challenge. 
um, and they didn't have like I said, they didn't have a massive budget to do that and um, so what they decided to do was tap into culture and the veganery movement and they wanted to own that movement um, and they, they, that was sort of really clear throughout as well um, in terms of how they did that um, with the budgets they had they focused purely on social and PR um, and, and tactics that, that, that just involved those two things and I think what was really interesting and what was sort of a bit of a breath, breath of fresh air to see in the PR award entries was um, people looking at PR holistically as well and I'm sorry I'm talking really niche here about PR but it was looking at looking at it holistically it's not just about column inches anymore and they did that and even in terms of how they presented their results as well they didn't just lead with you know AVE or you know not allowed to say that anymore but you know that the, the, the old sort of, sort of traditional approach to what success looks like they looked at it really holistically and, and that that sort of really stood out for me as well um so yeah in in terms of if um of, 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 of the entry itself it was dramatic it kept you gripped throughout they obviously had this video which they used for the launch which they, which they included as well as other sort of quotes from um from peers and from the media um and uh, yeah and obviously the results spoke for themselves they, it was ridiculous and, and they linked back to the sales um, and that's that's what mattered yes it was really engaging throughout but here's a question has anybody tried the vegan sausage roll yes i love it oh yeah <laughs> i mean we couldn't get a hold of one we i mean we have teams from the agency going out every day to try and find them and that is that is quite a uh, coup for greg's is it not Wow, I know. Do you know, I've never tried one, but I do. <laughs> one of my colleagues went and got one and um, she put into it and they'd given her the wrong one. Oh, no, exactly. So we shouldn't talk about that. That's that's what you shouldn't do. We market it really, really well. We just don't give them one out to um, a vegan. Yeah, that's what you, you don't do. So what's that? Okay. I was going to add there was one more thing I forgot to say on that that I thought really stood out as well sorry just one more thing was how they worked with the other agencies so how they um were, were, how they showed the integrated approach and um how they work together really well I think that's really important if you are working with other agencies make sure that's really clear and show how, show how you work as a team as well yeah I mean I think what's really interesting we actually got a call the other day from a company who will remain nameless and they had said to us oh can you credit us in this piece of work that we worked with this agency on and now we're saying well we, we can't doctor someone's entry but you get the agency to if, if they're happy to change it we'll change it but i think often than not there's a lot of people that do enter and they don't credit the companies they work with pretend they did it all themselves and actually they've collaborated with maybe two or three different types of businesses do you see that quite a bit in the entries that you're conscious of yeah, I think it's about being fair, isn't it? And and be honest about your role in that. Don't try and don't do do not try and capitalise on other people's work. If it's a team effort, it's a team effort. It's it's back to being human as well. Um, like Ruben said, and being honest about the, you know the challenges within that as well and how you overcame them. Yeah. Um. Are there ever any challenges with some agencies? <laughs> I always look at entries more positively if they talk about how different agencies and clients have worked together because I think that's the reality for, for most people is, yeah. is different from different places working on something so so when one paper says yeah we did it all it was all us you actually you make it sound a bit suspicious it's like mm, was it really, <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. And, judge, and judges know you know most judges have entered work themselves they read a lot of entries you know they can spot those inconsistencies or those things that don't quite ring true so I think it's yeah it's much better to be to be generous actually yeah, yeah no absolutely I mean we've we've had situations before not not when it comes to crediting other companies but where judges have been reading things and it almost seems too good to be true and obviously everybody's judged on the truth of the paper but you know it's not the first time I've had a judge saying actually I want to phone that engine and want to quiz them a little bit about it have you ever done that in any of the judgings even whether it be the drum or anything else have you ever had to do that Quiz anyone? No, but I know there's been a lot of debate in the room, and occasionally you'll find a judge who's got some sort of insider knowledge that they're able to share, or you know, who's got an opinion about things. So mm -hmm. it gets hotly, hotly discussed. Yeah, definitely. I, I do remember an example whereby there was a paper. I think it was for an, for an app, and it sort of made this app said this app is incredible. It's you know broken all records, and then then I so I sort of searched the app store for the app, and it and it didn't exist anymore. So it was like, mm, well, it can't be that good. Uh, so I think you know sometimes don't, you know don't expect the judges might just have a little bit of a dig around the edges just yeah. to sort of yeah. 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 yeah definitely and I mean when it comes to that kind of thing then so supporting information so obviously you know they've told a great story I mean this is where you can back up anything you see because if you've got the support and evidence then you can maybe verify it but what would you say are the really kind of key 
sort of support and info that people should supply if they can. Obviously, not everybody has access to everything, but what, what kind of strengthens an AIM chaser ribbon? I'll come to you. I think, um, I think, especially for the social purpose awards, there's a level of authenticity that you're looking for. So, um, what I'll say is, for instance, on the story sign, which I know we haven't got the film for, which is a Huawei entry. Um, which was a, an app that they developed to show off their image recognition technology. And it basically helps deaf um, children read alongside um, their hearing parents um, by delivering word, reading words on the page and then delivering them in, in sign language by a little avatar. It's really smart. But it's got all the hallmarks, if you just look at the film or if you just look at the exact summary, of a kind of a stunty sort of slightly fake entry. So what they did really well to substantiate it is, like, for instance, a lot of the... Um, award film was delivered by deaf people and by people within deaf organizations that they'd work with to make the um, app really work for deaf children so you really got that sense of like they'd done the work they'd done the authenticity and they'd given away the uh, app to other platforms you know and then obviously the the impact is the really really crucial bit because I think what we've all said is like if you see a great entry for a great piece of work that you really admire but at the end of the day the results don't really stack up then it's yeah. never going to rise to the top of the top of the mm. tree. Yeah, absolutely. Toby, what about you? Sorry, to turn my mic on. Um, I mean, I think I think for me, it's, it's it's less about what information it is. It's actually one of the biggest mistakes I often see is is someone sets out some objectives up front in the paper, and then the results they put don't bear any relation to the objectives. I mean, it's a really simple thing. But it's almost like if you set, said you're going to set out and do these things, then when it gets to results, make sure you've absolutely said, and here's how we achieve those things. Yeah. And um, it's, 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 quite a, it's quite a straightforward, simple thing. But as I said, it's less about what information it is. It's just making sure you're being really consistent through the paper in terms of what you were trying to achieve. Yeah, definitely. I suppose it's gathering that information as well. We speak to a lot of people and on this webinar, I don't know if there's many, but the marketing teams are sometimes left to do the entry. So it's a case of put the entry together um, and then, you know, and, and they're trying to get information from all these divisions. You just won't give them it, although it's an amazing piece of work just because everybody's so, so busy. So in terms of that kind of sign off process, I mean, if you get any advice of how maybe you've done it or how you know other people do it, just because it's obviously very risky spending all that time in an entry, sending in and there's tons of errors. So how would you go about sort of signing it off? So, Ribbon, do you want to start? I would agree. So I left, um, I, uh, I left a job at, uh, my job at Proximity after eight years. And the final, the last thing that my um, boss said to me as I left the door was, have you done those award entries yet? And the thing <laughs> is, that it's, it's so often the thing that gets left to like the last week. You know, we're so deadline driven as an industry. And the bit that you will miss out on isn't the craft of the entry, it's getting the results that you need. So, yeah. you know, I think, Lisa, you were saying something yesterday about starting out by thinking about the award entry and the and the results like almost first before you even decide whether to enter. Yeah, I was saying that, you know, when you um, start any sort of project or pitch or campaign or whatever it is, if you start with a, if you, if you can see a beginning and end, you, then I, I would I would form it. It's almost like use the template, the awards template as your as your project guide almost and um, so you actually start your work thinking not with the obviously not with the ultimate goal of winning um an award but you're not you're not going to you know you're not going to land in a bad place if that is your if that is your mission and um, and then work work along that project thinking about those different categories and then when it comes to actually finally entering the award all that information should be there for you ready to have um and and, and drop in and everyone's agreed to yeah no absolutely and toby do you have anything to add to that no, I think that's right. I mean, I think that's it's good discipline for anything you do in marketing. It's actually, you know, what are you trying to achieve? Uh, what's the insight? What's the work? And what's the results? And and actually, if if you sort of apply that in your day to day life, um, it's going to make writing awards uh, papers a whole load easier. Yeah, absolutely. And then that brings me nicely onto the clients. <laughs> so obviously, I mean, sometimes we've had situations where people have almost well sometimes we've won the award we've we hold the nominations we obviously don't reveal them until the announcements go out and then we have people come and saying oh um, my client's not approved it can you can you get rid of the end chamber thinking oh no you've won you've won and we we can't tell them so how important is it to maybe get the client buy-in at the beginning as opposed to just as you've signed it off at the end 
So Toby, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah, that's um, obviously quite important. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think most clients, well, I hope most clients would want to be winning awards, not, not for the winning awards bit, but again, but just to, as a good exercise and demonstration of effectiveness of the work that's going on. So, um, uh, so yeah, I, I'd be surprised. I think I'd ask the clients sooner rather than later because yeah, there's no point putting all that effort and energy in if um, if you're going to get to the end and they're going to go, oh, well, I'd, I'd rather you didn't uh, put that in. But like I say, I'd hope that most clients would want to be seen to be doing it for the rigor of the exercise as much as for the winning of the award. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think you know the other thing is as well the, the client testimonials. So you know when when people we were talking about this as well, having like your information and everything written in the context of the category. So. Sometimes we often see entries that have a just a generic client, you know, oh, you're great, this was great. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, but what was great? So, I mean, how important is that in terms of sort of skewing the client testimonial to really suit the category? Lisa, do you want to pick that up? So, yeah, I think, you know, having your clients buy in from the word go is, um, is really important. But I think what you don't want is you I think you can always tell when 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 you've written it yourself and just got the client to approve what ideally you want is like the genuine input from from yeah. the client um uh you know that's it's maybe it's a little bit more heartfelt or they talk about the real impact it had on the business um I think that that's really really important and I think the other point um is, is sort of brings it to is the point about sometimes you see papers that are entered into multiple categories um but um, the, the worst case is when they've literally been copy and pasted into, into the categories. So I think there was, an, I seem to remember there was an example whereby there was a paper and it was actually quite good. And in an integrated category, it did really well, but it was also entered into a press category with exactly the same paper. And it was kind of like, well, the, so the criteria are different for this category. So you need to have rewritten the paper to reflect what it is that that, that category needs to deliver. So, so I think that is another watch out. If you're entering in multiple categories, make sure the paper you're entering is appropriate for that category you haven't just sort of carpet bombed the, the categories with the same paper yeah i mean i think sometimes as well that's also painful for judges when people don't enter the right things or they don't enter something they should have entered until we i know you picked up on this yesterday you were saying oh my god it's, it can be frustrating sometimes and um, i mean what advice would you give to people because i think that's probably some of the hardest things to really kind of work out is where should what end what category should i get into um and i know you can't answer for them but what kind of thought process do you think you would give to that when people are struggling to know where to enter things? I mean, I think it, it, it kind of clearly depends on the award and depends on the categories. I mean, I think, um, you know, some awards um, have very specific craft categories. So they focus much more on the creative work versus the results. And I think that's perfectly valid. If, if that particular award is set out that this is what the criteria is for that, then that, that's uh, absolutely fine. But I, but I think fundamentally, it's looking at the work you've delivered and and, um, uh, and not, and as I say, not just carpet bombing categories, but just being really clear on where are the ones where we think we've actually got the best chance of, of winning um, and entering into those categories. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just so that people know how it kind of works, is if, um, if the judges find that maybe you've entered into the wrong thing, <clears throat> they can move it. But what they wouldn't do is move you multiple times. So often judges will say, oh God, if they were if they were in this category, they would do better. And actually some people will say to us, why did you move us? Why were, was our entry moved? And often not, it's because it stood a much better chance somewhere else or it was just in the wrong place. Um, so judges are very kind in lots of ways. So thank you. <laughs> I think one thing I would add is it's always worth looking at what won last year. So you can see what, what, what the expectation is of that category. And it doesn't mean sometimes you can't do a swerve. You know, I've won awards in categories where it's like, it, it fits in that category, but it's different to all the other entries, and that's okay. But I just think I, th I think it's a good shout to go and have a look at, at, at what wins generally in, in, in that kind of category and just make sure you're in the right place. Yeah, definitely. And then talking about making those kind of decisions, obviously you were chair last year, Ruben, so you were chair of the jury, which is obviously comes of its own stress and choosing your own winner. Now, we did have a video to play, but we don't, um, for some reason, the tech wants to fail us today but that's okay we can deal with that but what we'll do is we'll post the link of the video in the chat but I would still really like to pick up on this piece of work um do you want to talk about tell everybody what it is you can unveil it and tell everybody what the entry was how it worked and, and why you sure. really it. 
I mean, I think the thing was that we're looking through all of the work and we had loads of great debates and the, the Grand Prix winner was a really clear and obvious Grand Prix winner. But as the sort of chairs award, you're kind of looking for something that stands out and is different and is maybe something that's a little bit of a sign of the times. Yeah. So um, all of the other work was all done with, with, with good sized budgets, you know, with tip, traditional clients and traditional agencies. But the thing that I chose for the chairs award was um, the led by donkeys um, sort of political campaign um, that was entered by crowdfunder. So crowdfunder, the organization that um, raised all the money to enable led by donkeys to do, to buy all the billboards and do all the stuff that they did around the, the last election and around Bre the Brexit vote. So they dedicated their award to um, the 23,105 members of the public that had, uh, that had stumped up to like make the campaign happen. And I felt that was a really interesting sign of the times where it wasn't, as I say, a traditional client or a traditional agency, but they had probably one of the best standout pieces of creative and PR of the year with no budget. So it's kind of nice to just pick something that is, that is completely different. It's really and different. That yeah. you wish you'd done, but you kind of couldn't, could never have done because you, because <laughs> you're not in that, in that uh, setting. Yeah, that's really nice. I mean, we're obviously talking about all the nice things that sort of, because I, I guess that kind of won you over then emotionally because you thought, God, you've kind of got a little soft spot for it. But what kind of things do you see in angels that you hate? So we talk about all the nice things. What do you not like? So Toby, let's come to you. Um, well, I've already covered the thing about, you know, having objectives and results that don't marry up. That, that does really annoy me. Um, I think... Um, Sometimes you can, very occasionally, you can see papers whereby um, someone's clearly spent about 10 minutes on it. Uh, and, oh, my God, the deadline today. Quick, get something in. It's just thrown a few sentences together and just bunged it in. Um, it's kind of like, well, I'm not sure that's worth the, it's worth your effort. Um, and I think, um, you know, clearly, show, you know, being able to show the creative work in an easy way. I mean, that's actually quite a practical thing around judging is that if you have to sort of, open multiple links and, um, you know, hundreds of different um, JPEGs and things to get your head around the work that it's quite, um, it can be quite confusing. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, so, so as much as you can do to just really, you know, condense that work into sort of one place is really helpful. Yeah. Okay. And Lisa, what about you? Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with the, you know, making sure that don't give the judges legwork to do. Make it really clear. Make it really succinct. Don't waffle. We've said all that. Um, I think as well is um, assumptions. So um, when people make assumptions, in especially in the insight section, um, yeah. just make it really clear where those insights came from. Um, you know, just going back to the supporting evidence that we just talked about. It doesn't have to be like reams and reams of graphs or whatever, but just show you know what what where those um, where that where that insight came from. Um, don't just say we think or we we heard or you know this new story said so we did this. Um, just yeah, make that really clear. Um, mm -hmm. And then finally, just talk just in terms of. Um, I mean, this is a personal one, and this is and there's a lot of debate around this. And I think we had a lot of debate around this when we judged the the PR awards, but particularly in PR, um, just looking at the new ways of measuring success in PR. It's not just about column inches, and in fact, it's not just about KPIs, and that goes across all award entries. It's about what those KPIs meant for the business, and and making sure that it's really clearly tied back to that. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I think, especially in PR, because because I think people were sort of thinking about it from an old lens. Of PR and I think it's definitely modernized as the years have been on. Yeah, it was really interesting actually because in some of the some of the um, the award entries, the um the social results were were so strong, but for some reason they had the head some of the headlines were about like X amount of press coverage. Um, even though that the audience was a um I'm thinking one in particular, there was a it was a Gen Z audience. Um and with the focus of launching something in London and they focused very much on press coverage in London but like obviously that audience aren't reading papers that was the wrong audience so and, and they, they sort of tailed off with with the social results at the end I just didn't understand why they did that so I like, yeah. always had like what you know it was it, yeah just just thinking about it in, from that point of view as well from the audience point of view yeah and Ruben before we come to you I just want to remind people if you want to ask any questions and please do obviously We've got a little bit of time left, which we can come to questions if you've got any. So, Ruben, anyway, over to you about things that you do not like. I think I think one thing that stands out is when people um, really introduce a lot of their internal kind of 
uh, language and their internal methodology and their internal jargon. So you'll have people go, you know, we to to crack this brief, we we applied our unique methodology of like PPYP, and then we did, the, and it, you know, it bears no relation to the work that you see at the end of it. But it's like they really they really talk about, you know, they really talk up like, you know, what their their um their really their internal language and processes, and it's like, you know, why should why should that matter really? Yeah, no, definitely. Can you imagine judging an ad tech awards <laughs> where everything's acronyms and it's like, I don't even, I don't even know how to say that. Like, <laughs> you see the initials, do you see the words or trust me, you should, you should see what comes through. Um, we had an entry once where I remember someone entered and it was a really good report, but they had left all their track marks on. Okay. And it was things like um, double check the client said that. Um, was that definitely the results? <laughs> of course, you know, if you validated that, and it was like, oh my God. And, and it was many moons ago where, you know, when the awards were a lot smaller, and we managed to sort of say to them in time, like, you maybe want to change it uh, because, you know, because they would have, I mean, it was a clear kind of like, oh my God, is, is the entry even real? Um, and it was a real entry. It was just someone very junior that um, was running it. And there's no disrespect. Obviously, there's lots of really smart people out there. But how important would you say it is to, kind of get seeing people in the business to double check. I mean, I think I'm, I'm answering it already, but if you want to put some context around it, I mean, I know it's busy and people don't have a lot of time, but you know, in my view, if you're going to spend money, you're going to put the effort into it, you might want to get someone senior to check it. Is any, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it's not It's not just senior, actually. It's just someone who's not had anything or, or had less to do with the campaign. Yeah. Just to get them to read it, to go, because... I think Ruben says sometimes you know you write these papers and you make you inadvertently make a bunch of assumptions that people know this and know that and actually they don't. So getting someone to read it who doesn't really know much about it is, is always quite a worthwhile exercise because they'll go, well, hang on, I've no idea what you mean by this thing here or what's that got to do with anything. So, so just have, having that different perspective is definitely helpful. Definitely, I think you've just I think you've been sold by that entry you love so much. You knew nothing about it, and by the end of it, you were like, yeah, I get this. I'm an expert. <laughs> exactly yeah if you, any any marine technology anyone needs just let me know <laughs> absolutely um ribbon do you have anything to add to that yeah i mean the obvious thing is that um you should really be talking to people who've judged awards you know because they've sat on the other side of the desk so it, when you're putting that entry together you know running it past the more senior people in your business are more likely to have sat on on judging panels and they'll be going look as a judge you know, this wouldn't yeah. get my attention or, you know, you're missing this crucial bit that I would be looking for. And so, yeah, I think that that's really helpful. Yeah. And there's a question come through, a really good question, actually, around personal categories. So whether it be rising star, marketer of the year, whatever it might be. So the question is, like, how would you position that kind of entry as opposed to a campaign or a piece of work, like as a person or or if you were going to write it, an entry on behalf of, of your colleague, for example, yeah, how do you go about that? So, Ruben, do you want to take the mantle? Yeah, that's, that's a really good one. And I'm trying to think back to the ones in the Social Purpose Award. I think it's really important to, I think, you know, to to do it as a team. So even if it's about an individual, so you really get um, a nuanced and balanced view, you know, so it doesn't come across. I mean, British people anyway are like re have real trouble with egotism. So we're always kind of like, oh, I think you are. So it's really good, you know, if you can kind of evidence it and then get some testimonials in it. Um, but I also think it's fantastically useful and it's a really good thing to recognize those people often who are kind of standing out, you know, who are not high performers, but are maybe kind of like bringing a different perspective to the industry or kind of um, moving things along. Um, so I think it's a really good thing. But, yeah, just do it as a team effort, you know, and all agree that you're going to do it and take a bit of a kind of rational view of it. Yeah. Toby? Yeah, I haven't actually judged so many of those sorts of awards, but it, and it is really tricky because, you know, as you say, that the, the British way is to sort of you know play down your efforts in a, in a way in a paper where you're supposed to be like, uh, you know, talking about how amazing you are. Um, so, um, but I, th I think I, th I think actually though this, the same principles still apply to work um, papers. So, whilst it's about an individual and their efforts, I think still going back to how they've contributed towards effectiveness and how they've contributed towards great work, 
um, and making sure you get the, the balance between those two things. And then, and then clearly the third dimension for, for a people entry is, is kind of the, the people dynamic and how they work in teams and, and, and bring people with them, et cetera. So, um, but I think um, certainly for the, for the results and the work, I think those two, two bits are actually still constants from normal, normal papers that they should, um, they should try and communicate. Yeah, and Lisa, do you want want to add anything more to that? I think it's um, I think it's more about for, for me, it's the uh, the personal challenges you face. That I'm just going by um, personal experience, having entered one of these, and it was I've sort of really wanted to show, I guess, yeah, the the, the human side of it and the challenges you face in it as an individual in that role, and and how you overcame it, and um, yeah, I think that just adding a personal touch to it is really important. Yeah, I suppose as well, getting your personality through, isn't it? If you're writing it, then maybe yeah. you're a bit of a person. Um, yeah, exactly. You don't have to hide behind the sort of corporate veil, if you like. Um, we have another question, actually, which is a really interesting one. And it's all around your thoughts on visualising or, or kind of jazzing up written entries. Or is it better to stick to the given template? Controversial. But I'm going to open it up to whoever wants to pick this one up. I think there's something nice about um, standing out within the constraints of what you're doing. So uh, we we did something the other year and it was um, we'd done a sort of 1920s murder mystery for a client. So we wrote the entry all in kind of like 1920s kind of Jeeves and Worcester type stuff. So there's no visual, you know, you couldn't do anything visually with a template, but you could do you could play with the language and you could have a lot of fun. Yeah. Standing out. That's good. I remember once for the chip shop wars, I mean, you can back a long time ago, maybe it sound ancient, everything was a long time ago. And it was an entry for, I think it was like, have a break, have a Kit Kat. And it was like a German take on the Kit Kat, something so funny. And I mean, the ad, it was rubbish. The, the ad was, was, was terrible. But what they had done was they, um, they basically sent all the judges a Kit Kat. So all the judges, as soon as so we were briefed, as soon as they got to read that entry, we had to give them the Kit Kat. And what you found were the ironic, because also chip, chip shops can be a bit slapdash and some serious stuff and some not so. But what we found was from a creativity point of view, the judges endured the crap video because they ate their Kit Kat. And, and the way they had done the end. Is that allowed? Is that bribery? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was, I don't know if that's bribery. I know it might have been bribery, but you know, but it worked really well because the judges thought, you know, it was really, really clever for what they were trying to do. Um, so I suppose, you know, working remotely as well it maybe makes us a bit more creative about how we think about things you know i know from we're not talking about pitching today but you know from a pitching point of view agencies are having to think differently you can have lunch your plan remotely but you know so there's maybe kind of edgy things you can do that's not necessarily you know screwing up the whole entry um the, the entry reports we don't want you to deviate too much because it makes your life difficult but as you see yeah because yeah, i think if, you have to as long as you keep the fundamentals of the structure i think it's fine to jazz it up i think the the the, just remember that the judges, because they, they have to compare papers, and if one paper's gone so far off piste, it's kind of like, well, how on earth do I compare this with this? Yeah. Uh, so, so I think as long as you retain those fundamentals of of um, the, the things we've set out already, then I, uh, I think it's it's fine. But just don't don't go too mad because otherwise the judges sat there going, how on earth am I supposed to assess? Yeah. The everything else I've got in front of me. Yeah. Yeah. No, they... I, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing a with doing a really nice pdf that goes along with it but yeah watch. maybe have like the basics there but then think about how else you can build on those different senses in some way and I, and I think actually it also goes back to what toby was saying when you look at an entry and you go they really haven't bothered with this then you know even if the piece of work is great sort of emotionally you're a bit like well yeah you know, it's, it's really a bit copy awesome. yeah yeah, and sometimes we've had entries where people will enter in a category and they'll put the wrong category name and stuff. <laughs> You're like, no, or the wrong, worst is the wrong awards. And you're like, we're not getting wrong here. <laughs> I <laughs> think so, and, and sometimes when you get a PDF, what you see is this is the standard template that they've used for entering all of the different awards that they're putting into this year, and it's like they haven't bothered to write one specifically for you, and, and again, you can spot that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Anyway, I think what we'd say is, you know, if it's a good piece of work, it's a good piece of work, regardless of these kind of little, you know, schoolboy or girl errors, but it's it's not ideal at the end of the day you want it to the be. Thing, I, I saw one last week, which was a, which was an award film, which was the best award film that I saw, although it didn't win in the end, but um, 
and it was personalised to that award. So the voiceover like referenced, oh, it's good enough to win an X Y Z award and things like that. And you're like, oh, they've yeah. so got your attention as against all the others. So I think doing something that is about that particular award <laughs> and award category and ceremony is really helpful. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, sorry. No, I was going to say that I think that shows passion, and I think that's really important to that that, that comes through and it doesn't come across sort of cocky or nonchalant, you know. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think the thing is, you don't have to have lots of budget either to do quirky things. So, and equally, if you don't and you just play it straight, then that's fine as well, as long as you tell the story and the narrative really well. So before we wrap up, what I would love to do is just to sort of finalise, I mean, we've talked about lots of stuff, but if you were to summarise it into your sort of three top tips, what would they be? So Lisa, let's go with you first. Um, I think it, for, for me, it's make it, first number one is make it an exciting read. Um, and then I guess it's sort of secondary to that, but set out your problems and your task uh, really sort of simply and concisely. And then the final point was don't focus. Um, I think I'm talking from personal experience here when I was uh, more junior and starting out writing awards. Um, I, may, I might take old awards that had won previously and try and think, oh, I have to write like this for it to for it to work. I think just scrap that. Do not look at old award entries. I mean, ref reference them in your head, but do not use them as a template for, for writing new awards. Yeah. And Toby? Yeah, I think um, for me, the critical thing is, firstly, make sure you always have your objectives, your insight, your work and your results, and importantly, your results that ma marry back to the objectives. I think don't assume knowledge um, of the judges. So I think that point about getting someone who's maybe not had much to do with the campaign to have a read of it is probably quite helpful. Um, and, and then I think, um, just to echo what's just been said about making it interesting, um, and, you know, the judges often do have to plough through a hell of a lot of awards, so anything you can do to just lighten their, uh, lighten their load a little bit is probably appreciated. Yeah. And Ruben? Uh, I think um, make it fun, because uh, judging is, is actually really hard work, uh, especially at the initial phase where you're going through everything. So if you can make it fun for uh, judges, they really like that. Yeah. Um, I think evidence of impact. So however you're, you're talking about results, you know, what actually do they mean? Like how have they changed anything for the client, for the world, whatever it is. So evidence of impact is really important. Um, and I forgot the third one, but it's really good. <laughs> I think think about the, um, I think be really clear about why it should win. So I think I see a lot of entries, which are like, we did a piece of work and, and it was, and it was good. And it's like, well, why should it win? Like what, what's, yeah. what makes it worthy of, of being better than everything else that's being entered in this category. So really sit down and think, why is this a winner and try and get that across. Yeah. Thank I, you. I do think one, um, I was going to say, I think just on that, I think one of the other tips I've heard over the years is, is almost write a paper as if you're trying to create some learning for the industry. Mm -hmm. so, so if someone else came to this paper, it's like, well, why should I read this one? Oh, it's because, well, the learning for the industry in this one is it, it might be about a rebrand or it might be about how to use social brilliantly. But having that is actually, again, I'm not saying it's the only way of doing it, but it's, it's another quite interesting way of, of writing a paper because then you've got really clear reasons as to why it should win because this actually isn't just because we did a brilliant piece of work and it was great. It actually has some learning that other people can can take away yeah yeah so Lisa, were you going to say something there no i'm just totally agreeing with that i think showing innovation that's what we're all here to do you do, the same things can't win year and year over it's how have you stretched the industry how have you pushed it further like you know it's not just about tech i don't, it's, I don't mean that but what have you done how have you thought differently how have you how are you pushing the boundaries i think that that is that's what these awards are here to do aren't they yeah, so we keep setting our bar higher every Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, I was going to wrap up there, but we do have one final question and I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, someone was saying that it's true that the awards are there to guide the industry. So how does this move the industry forward? No, oh, that was, that was me. <laughs> All I was doing, I was agreeing with my other two panellists because yeah, I thought it was such an important point. You know, that's the one thing as a judge you're being asked to do is have a point of view about the industry that you work in. So if you know that's what you're trying to do, reward work that you think yeah. is the, the pinnacle, you know, and is and is oh, moving yeah. forward. So. Yeah, definitely. And the whole idea is to build good practice. So what we're trying to do now for awards is, you know, it's not just about winning awards. It's about how you can showcase examples of excellence because our readers, you know, they're hungry for that information. 
and awards are a really good way to sort of shine through the kind of good players and the great work. So yeah, I hope everybody's really enjoyed it. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much to our panelists for taking part. So thank you. Thanks for having us. Else, we have an early bird deadline on the 12th of June, so make sure to get your entries in. But we've got a really an amazing team on hand, so let them know if you need any help whatsoever. But in the meantime, take care and stay safe, and we will see you very, very soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.